the rights of EU citizens is an issue which is still um, unresolved in terms of what how the UK press is covering it. What are your thoughts on how the process of the talks with regards to expats and EU citizens in the UK is going? Do you think there needs to be more compromise? Well, we clearly on the EU side, uh, the 27 and all European institutions, we made out of it the issue number one. So we start the negotiation process with the citizens' rights because we believe that citizens are not those who should pay for this uh, process of leaving the uh, European Union by one of the member states. And uh, that's why it's one of the red lines for our negotiations. And that's why also the European position has been from the very beginning very clear what we want is to extend practically the rights that citizens of European Union, those in UK coming from the 27 and those here on the continent coming from UK, that those citizens should uh, be, not be those who will pay for the, for the Brexit and they, they will be our most important um, negotiating, uh, I, I hesitate to say element, but part of the negotiation. We start with it, we created the papers. The paper of the European Union is based on the assumption that we should extend the rights uh, for those people who have uh, already uh, decided to, to live here or, or there. The paper coming, the position coming from the UK is very different. It's like the effort to uh, incorporate the future rights of those people into the UK immigration law and separate it from the European law. And we cannot accept this, this, uh, this approach. And also what is in UK paper which makes us also unhappy before the negotiations is that it does not reduce on anything the uncertainty, the legal uncertainty those people have been living in for, for a year uh, now. And it's also not clear what will be the, the instruments used in the future. So much is just left to be decided in due time. We cannot accept that. One of the uh, issues is to do with the European Court of Justice and who will be the legal uh, arbiter over the rights of EU citizens in the UK. Theresa May has obviously made it one of her red lines. Do you think she's being unreasonable given this is a negotiation? Do you think she's, she needs to sort of loosen and be prepared to talk about jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice? Uh, you know, uh, both sides are, are authorised, have the right to, to have the position on it, and uh, but we also have to make it clear that we are aiming at maintaining the rights as they are in the European Union for the European Union uh, current citizens and there is a, a cut-off cut -off date which we hope we will find agreement on this cut-off date and then those people will stay with the rights which are protected by European Court of Justice. So it is our negotiating position. One of the things which has been in the UK press a lot in the past couple of weeks, particularly after the general election, is a possibility of a softer Brexit, some kind of agreement regarding the single market or the customs union. But a key issue is, of course, immigration. Do you think there's any movement with regards to the four freedoms in terms of an agreement with the UK about not having freedom of movement whilst also maintaining some form of access to the single market and customs union or is that a red line for you? No, you, you know we've been very clear from the very beginning that it's, it's not about what we call cherry picking now so just to pick up some things which you like in the European Union and to get rid of others that you are not happy with so all those issues have their framework have their uh, monitoring system have the judicial also coverage so those issues have to be seen in, in its entirety and uh, that, that's what is very important. But I also uh, think that it is important to to understand what the UK wants for the future because we are talking now about the withdrawal. When we talk about citizens we are talking about withdrawal. But then for the future, if you want to stay in the custom union, which I personally think would be the smartest decision on the UK uh, side and the producing also the, um, the, the way towards finding the Irish uh, solution, uh, but we have heard very clearly no custom union, no uh, single uh, market. But whether you can live without any uh, kind of custom union, I just can't imagine this. So I hope that uh, in the course of the negotiation, it will be also a learning process and we will finally hear what the UK wants for the future with more precision, but also with more understanding of, of the consequences of this. Just to, just to follow up on that, the UK Labour Party's manifesto in the general election, the, the opposition party, said that they wanted to maintain the benefits of the single market and the customs union. 
but the leader Jeremy Corbyn has now said that he would like to leave both the single market and the customs union. Do you think that that's a impossible position to maintain any benefits whilst also leaving no, both? If you, if you, I mean, first of all, if you are not a member, anything that is uh, not a membership in the European Union is, is worse than membership. So that's absolutely uh, clear. And you cannot, the famous cake, eat it and have it, it's also impossible to, to maintain. Uh, but I also think that if you, if you are so clearly repeating all the time, which is the case of your Prime Minister, that you want to be out, the UK wants to be out from the single market and from the customs union, from the ECJ jurisdiction, then that means that you really, that's what I would call the hard Brexit. I no deal is just we should exclude it. No, we have to have a deal. But hard Brexit means that you just leave everything, even in a transition period. If you get rid of the major machinery for growth, which is single market, if you move to the custom, uh, custom uh, to the tariffs, to the tariffs, which can be on 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 beef, I'm told more than 50 percent from zero. So that means that uh, you cannot have any benefits, uh, or you can have much less benefits than staying. If you have a, a solution that would be acceptable for us, there would be sort of custom union, which probably is thinkable. And, and finally, there's been a lot said about this divorce bill, the, the Brexit bill the, to, to leave the European Union, what, what the UK will be paying. Are you any nearer to any kind of figure about what you'd expect the UK to be paying? No, I, I think we should forget about figures because it's not about figures. It's really about the me method, methodology for this uh, process and to agree what, once we know what UK wants to continue, if UK wants to continue in some programs, then like Norway or Switzerland, then there is a contribution, financial contribution to the budget. If you stay, which we hope will be understood by the Brits also, you stay in the, to the end of the current financial perspective, which is our budget, which is implemented also till 2000. 22 or 2023. 20, if the Brits benefit, then also there is the contribution to the EU budget. There is a, a lot of contingency, um, liab contingent liabilities which are related to the pensions of those who are working in the European Union. So I hope that we will find that there are loans taken from European. Uh, which are cheaper than taken on the market from European investment uh, banks. So you have simply to agree that there is a lot of commitments, there is a lot of benefits, there are liabilities, there are assets. We just have to elaborate a joint shared methodology and then figures will come later on. And just finally, last question. Are you, with what you've seen, what you've heard so far, and are your colleagues impressed or disappointed by the UK's preparation and position to do the Brexit? I, I must say I am totally disappointed, first of all, with the decision. We respect it, we, we give full respect, but we regret it enormously, I think, on our side. Then we also think that there is a sort of lack of understanding of the consequences, which we, from this side, we don't see whether really people are really understanding the consequences of what's going to happen. And then I think too easy, what we hear is just too easy coming decisions or like we leave the single market, but it's 45 years of working together under the same standard, the same norms. Can you imagine that uh, the businesses in UK, which are UK businesses located there, that all, that all of a sudden then all the norms and standards which they have been accustomed to, to live with, to sell the products in, 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 uh, in our market, that that's all is gone and that the next years is just moving away from the standards which allow the enterprises to sell in the European single market, that would be very difficult.